You may be seated. So the prophet Isaiah speaking to us this morning that in the brokenness of a fallen world, we will see the king in his beauty. Uh, not too long ago, I was at a conference at which uh, one of the speakers made a claim that in every generation, there is a kind of central question that people have about God, which they need to get answered in order to be one to Christ. Uh, he looked back over the last 80 years or so, and his conclusion was that the baby boomers born between the end of World War II and the rise of the Civil Rights Movement want to know what is true. So if we share the gospel with them, we need to do some classic apologetics. We need to give reasons for what we believe. Generation Xers, that's my generation, want to know what is real. There is a suspicion of hypocrisy. Millennials born at the end of the 20th century want to know what is good. They will only follow Christ if they see that the church is righteous. And what do you suppose, he said, about you digital natives, the I generation? He said, you want to know what is beautiful. Now, of course, we all ask all of these questions. Philosophers have been wrestling with the good and the true and the beautiful for 2,500 years of liberal arts education. We all wonder why there is something rather than nothing, but maybe it's true at this moment in history when we are assaulted everywhere by the ugliness of transgression, that we have a deep longing for what is truly beautiful. And it is not enough for the current generation to be told that the gospel is true. They need to see for themselves that it is beautiful. So I think we are experiencing something that uh, Dostoevsky wrote about in the Brothers K when he said that, that the beautiful is the battlefield where God and Satan contend with each other for the hearts of humanity. Well, if we ask the question, what is beautiful, as I am trying to do in these President's Chapel Talks this year, maybe the first thing we notice is the beauty of the world around us. And I'll have more to say about that in October, and then particularly the beauty of humanity, and we'll talk about that in November. But the most basic beauty is the one true God. He is beauty itself, and the source of beauty in all other things, nothing is beautiful without God. Maybe the theologian who saw this most clearly was Jonathan Edwards. I think he wrote probably more about God's beauty than anyone before and maybe since. God alone is infinitely the most beautiful, Edwards wrote. He is, and, and all the beauty to be found throughout the whole creation is but the reflection of his brightness and glory. And, Edwards tried to show this with a series of comparisons. The beauty of trees and flowers, he wrote, with which God has bespangled the face of the earth is delightful. The beautiful frame of the human body, especially in its perfection, is astonishing. The beauty of, of the moon and stars is wonderful. The beauty of the highest heavens is transcendent. The excellency of the angels, very glorious but it is all darkness in comparison of the brighter glories of the creator of all, the very angels, they hide their faces before him. I doubt whether anyone has ever had a deeper longing for this divine beauty than King David. We looked at this a little bit last month. David's singular desire to behold the beauty of the Lord, not, not simply to glimpse it, but actually gaze upon it. David expressed this longing elsewhere. At the end of one of his other Psalms, for example, Psalm 17, he was looking to the rise of a bright new dawn, maybe to the, the, the brightness of eternity. And he said, as for me, Lord, I shall behold your face in righteousness. And when I awake, oh, this is so beautiful. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. 
And even in that little verse, we see so many important things about beauty. Beauty is real. We know that from what David says. We know there's a basis for beauty in the beauty of God. We know that, that God's beauty is deeply satisfying. We know that beauty is something we can see for ourselves. And that is my goal for us this morning, simply to see God to be beautiful. To see God to be beautiful. I am laboring under the burden of how difficult that is to do. To actually see that and express that in a way that others can see it. But I tell you that God is beautiful. He is visibly beautiful, invisibly beautiful, triunely beautiful, and in a transforming way. He is beautiful, first of all, visibly. I think one of the reasons why the Bible we can know that the Bible wants us to see God's beauty is because scattered through the scriptures, you have these amazing stories of people who beheld the visible beauty of the glory of God. And in fact, I think you can virtually equate those two words. When the Bible says glory, it's talking about the visible beauty of God. When Moses, for example, went up on Mount Sinai, he saw the beauty. He was surrounded by the glory of God like a consuming fire, something that made his own face radiant. The children of Israel saw it. They saw it when the glory of God descended on the tabernacle and it was so resplendent that no one could even enter. Isaiah saw it when he saw the Lord high and lifted up, seated on his glorious throne <clears throat> in the adoration of angels. And the disciples saw it too when they climbed up on that Mount of Transfiguration and Jesus appeared to them in those moments in his true divine glory. I think the Bible is telling us these stories so that we know God is beautiful and also to give us the hope that one day we too will see that beauty for ourselves. What Moses and Isaiah and Peter and James and John witnessed were pre-appearances of the beatific vision that every believer one day will see in the face of Jesus Christ. God visibly beautiful. And the reason I believe he sometimes makes himself visibly glorious. Can one of you bring me a cup of water from over, or a little bottle of water? I think we'll all be less distracted. Let's hear it for Hadley, bringing me a... <clears throat> Thank you so much. I think one of the reasons God has on these occasions made himself visibly beautiful is so that we could know beauty as one of his essential attributes. <clears throat> we sometimes uh, leave it off the list of the attributes of God, but his infinite beauty belongs alongside infinite wisdom, infinite power, infinite love, infinite knowledge. Beauty too is one of his defining characteristics, which is another way of saying he has inner as well as outer beauty. What a fortunate few have seen outwardly when they beheld the glory of God is presently, is present constantly within his very being. It's, a, it's an invisible as well as a visible beauty, and the visible beauty helps us to perceive what is unseen. I think that'll be true when we see the beatific vision. We will see the visible glory of Jesus Christ, and that visible beauty will testify to his spiritual qualities. And we can catch a glimpse of it even by faith today. There's beauty in the love that God shows to people who are lost and forgotten. How beautiful it is when God redeems a life. There is beauty, beauty in his grace that he shows to penitent sinners. There's beauty in the kindness that God shows to us when he takes care of everything that we need for life. There's beauty in God's justice when he rights our wrong. There is beauty in his humility, the way that he stoops to our level so that we can know him and love him. Are you seeing the attributes of God on display. And in those attributes are you seeing divine beauty. There's, there's beauty in God's goodness and truth. There's a reason why goodness, truth, and, and beauty are at the core of a liberal arts education. It's because they are united in the character of God. So what I am, am saying is that beyond 
Being a divine attribute in its own right, beauty is an aspect of all God's attributes. And maybe we see it most clearly of all in God's holiness and the way God is set apart from everyone and everything else in absolute purity. Jonathan Edwards was captivated by this holiness of God, not as something that kept him away in unrighteousness, but actually something that was deeply attractive by God's grace. Holiness, he said, is the infinite beauty and excellence of God. It is in a peculiar manner. It is the beauty of the divine nature. And in just a few moments, we'll have an opportunity to praise God for that beauty as we sing together outside about his holiness. Anyone who ever comes anywhere close to the holiness of God finds it utterly breathtaking, like those angels in God's sanctuary who forever cry out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his, we might say, beauty. But maybe this is true of every divine attribute. The closer we get to it, the more we understand it, the more we behold its beauty and the more we are drawn into the adoration of God. Now, let me take this deeper because whether visible or invisible, God's holy beauty gets multiplied when we see it triunely. There is one God in three persons. Each person of the Trinity is uniquely and individually beautiful, beautiful father, beautiful spirit, beautiful son. And that beauty gets expanded exponentially by the mysterious interplay of intra-Trinitarian relationships. There is a tri-unity of beauty within the Godhead. The Father is beautiful, beautiful in his, his power, in his faithfulness, in his loving grace for his wayward children. Is there anything in the Bible more beautiful than the picture of the old dignified father who runs to embrace his long lost son when he sees them on the horizon, the story of the prodigal son. It's the beauty of a father wrapping a son in his loving arms. When St. Augustine considered the loving fatherhood of God, he just he just cried out, oh, my supreme and good father, beauty of all things beautiful. The father is beautiful, too, in his love for his son, his beloved son, his only beloved son, the son he did not spare but freely gave up for us. That son is as beautiful as the father is. In fact, the son came for the very purpose of showing us the father's beauty. We have seen his glory, the scripture says, glory as of the only son from the father. And in his perfect life, oh, you see this when you read the Gospels, in his healing miracles, in his proclamation of the kingdom, in his obedient surrender, in his suffering cross, in his loving sacrifice for our sins, in his luminous resurrection, in his resplendent ascension, Jesus is showing us the beauty of God and he is showing it to us in his physical body. One day we will see it with our very own eyes, the most beautiful sight we have ever beheld, the glory of God, the beauty of God in the face of Jesus Christ because in the risen and ascended Christ, creation's beauty has reached its climax. But there is even more to be said because the spirit too is beautiful. Some of you English majors, I imagine, will know the immortal lines from God's Grandeur by Gerard Manley Hopkins. The poet images the Holy Spirit as the one who over the bent world broods with warm breast and with, ah, bright wings. It's an image of the beauty of the Spirit. The, the Spirit is the beautifier of the Father. He helps us see the Father in sacred scripture. He's the beautifier of the Son, particularly by raising him from the dead. It's the Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead in his beautiful resurrection body. The Spirit is the beautifier of creation with the Father and the Son. The Spirit made everything there is and made it beautiful. The Spirit, so remarkably, is the beautifier of the church, the one working in us to make us beautiful like Jesus. The Holy Spirit 
is the beautiful spirit. It is his work specifically to bring the world into the fullness of its beauty. And now the spirit wants to do something beautiful for us and in us. He wants, he wants, us to, he wants to help us see the beauty of God. He wants to help us see it visibly, invisibly, triunely. The Spirit does this partly by helping us see God's beauty in creation. We'll see more about this next month. But the natural world puts so many of God's beautiful attributes on display. And according to Romans, everyone ought to be able to see in that the beauty of God. But you ha in order to truly recognize it, you have to be full of God's Spirit. Without the Spirit, you can see the beauty of creation, but not the beauty of the Creator. The Spirit helps us see God's beauty through prayer. It's one of the reasons why prayer is an imp important priority for us as a campus. It's so that we can see the beauty of God. When we, we pray, the Spirit is helping us cry out with our heart longings to our Heavenly Father and then working in the world to advance the kingdom of God. The more you pray, the more you see that work. You see wounds healed, relationships reconciled, sins forgiven, souls set free. I tell you, wherever God is at work, everything is becoming more beautiful. And as we pray in the spirit, we are empowered to perceive the beauty of his saving and sanctifying work. And maybe most of all, the spirit helps us see God's beauty in the Bible. There is the beauty of God on every page, the place specifically where we learn about God's invisible beauty and his triune beauty is in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. We wouldn't know it otherwise. But as we meditate on, God's, on, on the Bible's saving message, we are arrested again and again by the loveliness of God. Now I emphasize all of this because until we see this beauty for ourselves, we are missing out on what matters most. Many of you, I think, will remember this was Augustine's lament after he finally came to faith in Christ. He wrote with a sense of sadness, late have I loved you, beauty so old and so new, late have I loved you. I was, I was in the world and I was seeking you there and in my unholy state, I plunged myself into the lovely created things which you made and those things kept me far from you until you called and cried out and shattered my deafness. Then you were fra fragrant, Augustine says, and I drew in my breath and now I pant after you. I tasted you and I feel but hunger and thirst for you, Augustine was filled with the sense of regret that he had waited so long to see the beauty of God. It's a reminder for us not to make the same mistake, not to miss out, not even to delay. And the reason why this generation, and I suppose every generation wants to know what is beautiful is because God has put this deep longing for beauty into our souls knowing that only he could ever satisfy it. And when we are dissatisfied, as you maybe feel this morning, as we all often do, whenever we feel lonely or unhappy, whenever we have longings in life that are going unfulfilled, this is a sign for us of our deep need for God. Trace the disappointments of life back to the deepest desire and you will discover the only thing big enough, beautiful enough to fill that is God himself. And this is why David was so, so desperate to see God. He knew that God alone could satisfy his soul. Let me read the words again of the closing words of Psalm 17. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness and when I wake up, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. And that's what Isaiah was saying to us as well in the words read for us earlier. It's a promise of scripture. Your eyes will behold the king in his beauty. And until you see that, you actually miss the beauty in everything else. 
That is why it was so obvious to me as I thought about these messages this year, we needed to start with the beauty of God himself. Even if it was hard for us to perceive, even if I wouldn't have a good way of expressing it, we needed to start with this. It's the foundation for everything that follows because without God, you will never experience the beauty of creation in a way that leads you to praise. You won't experience fully the beauty of humanity as made in his image. You won't experience the beauty of beloved community, which only comes as a gift of the spirit. You won't understand the beauty of sexual purity, not the way that God designed it. You'll never see the beauty of justice either. You'll just replace one form of oppression with another. But when we do see the beauty of God, we see the true beauty in everything else as a reflection of his beauty. I was doing a lot of reading on the beauty of God all through the summer. I liked this quotation from Robert, Robert O'Connell, something expressed at a theology conference here at Wheaton. He said, one glimpse of God's beauty can sweep the heart upward to himself, to the swelling fountain of unfailing sweetness that alone can satiate the soul's deep thirst for beauty. It's a reminder, if there's something in you that is thirsty for something, it is really thirsty for God. And you know, something amazing happens, something important happens when we find ourselves in the presence of something truly beautiful, we slow down. Beauty arrests attention. And rather than quickly moving on to the next thing, we linger in the presence of what is beautiful. And if we find it hard to linger in God's presence, hard to pray, you ever feel that? Hard to, to meditate in God's word, hard to, to worship and just to, to let all earthly cares aside and be absorbed in the focus of, of who God is as expressed in prayer and in the word and in worship, if we're finding it hard to linger in its presence, it must be for this reason that we're not really seeing the beauty of the triune God. Because when you do see the beauty, you wanna stay in its presence, the beauty of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, see it and you want to stay with it. And whenever seeing God's beauty is a struggle for us, as I think it is for all of us, we do well to pray these words from the Book of Common Prayer. Let's make it our prayer this morning. O oh God, mercifully grant that we, being delivered from the disquiet of this world, may by faith behold the King in his beauty. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. And let's go out now and worship him.